Shocking but true! Can you guess what has been grossly underrepresented in film noir scholarly studies? You got it, race. So here's something to get you thinking. What is the connection between post-war American film noirs, real estate tactics, urban cities, communism, and migratory patterns? Think about it. How could all of these vastly different things be somehow related? Okay, drum roll! Here it is! The reflection of stereotypical sociopolitical depictions of race in American culture in reference to the representation of African Americans in post-war American film noirs. Wow, that was a mouthful. So hang on to your seat as I explain how all of these different concepts are connected as well as share some insightful tidbits about various film noirs I've viewed this semester. So who or what is Jim Crow and why does he have laws? Just imagine walking down the street minding your own business in a suit or nice dress and having a police officer ask you to take off your clothes because you of course have no business dressing so nice. Yes, folks, this did happen, and this is what we know as the Jim Crow Laws. It is the title given to the enforced Southern caste system. Yes, white supremacy was king and ruled the racial climate in post-war America, especially in the South, where segregation was as natural as apple pie and baseball are American. These laws made it extremely difficult for African Americans to live in the South, especially with the mounting efforts from the National Negro Council and the NAACP regarding civil and labor rights. Jim Crow laws also managed to reinforce popular stereotypes of the time, like African Americans are unworthy, subhuman, stupid, immoral, simple-minded, and naturally belong in a subservient position to whites. Ouch. No wonder African Americans started to leave the South in droves. Okay, you're about to learn something that very few people know about. Listen up. What is the biggest underreported story of the 20th century? It has nothing to do with Britney Spears or Paris Hilton, I promise. It's the Great Migration from 1915 to 1970, where over six million black Southerners left the South and moved to cities across the country in order to get away from the mean old Jim Crow laws and to have a chance at a better life. On this map, you will see how African Americans migrated across the country. During the 1940s alone, 1.6 million African Americans left the South. California's African American population quadrupled due to its blossoming post-war economy. Which brings me to another facet of the Great Migration. As African Americans moved into the cities across the nation, this means that previously white neighborhoods were now interracial. The urban areas became saturated with African Americans due to the affordable housing options. Keep this in mind because I'll come back to this later. Also, the white jobs were being taken by African Americans and there was lack of a labor force in the South for cotton picking and other menial jobs. All of these changes, of course, exacerbated existing racial tensions. Another interesting thing occurred during the Great Migration, and that was the use of blockbusting and steering by real estate agents. Blockbusting involves scaring people to move because those people are moving into the neighborhood. Steering is where the realtor guides a buyer or renter of a protected class to a particular neighborhood. This prevented African Americans from moving into all white neighborhoods. Of course, these actions were made illegal by the Fair Housing Act of 1968. Nonetheless, 
Blockbusting and steering had an impact on society, where white people were moving out of the city into the suburbs, and African Americans lived primarily in the urban areas. Ultimately, according to Isabel Wilkerson, the Pulitzer Prize-winning author of The Warmth of the Other Suns, says that the Great Migration transformed urban America and recast the social and political order of every city it touched. That's a pretty big deal for a story that was hardly newsworthy during its time. So, I hope you are starting to get a picture of what was going on in post-war American society and how this could potentially impact the making of movies and the representation of African Americans. Now it's time to up the ante. What's communism got to do with it? <laughs> Good question. Let me give you some background information before we tackle this reference. All right, so up until 1948, the U.S. military still openly practiced and supported segregation. In 1941, Roosevelt signed an executive order to establish a Fair Employment Practices Committee, but it had no enforcement powers and managed to change very little. Post-war America needed a hero. We required strong leadership to help bridge the gap of racial inequalities. However, no one had stepped up to the plate yet. So, how is communism connected to African-American representation in post-war American film noirs? Here it goes. A. The Communist Party paid special attention to the problem of racial equality, especially in America, to presumably recruit more members. B. African-American leaders such as Benjamin Davis and Paul Roberson did not hide their support and sympathy for the Communist Party. C. The Cold War closed its grip upon American society in 1947. And D. Communists work with liberals to organize workers into unions and fight racial injustice. What this means is an increase in anxiety regarding the white experience of African Americans and the reinforcement of stereotyping blackness with evil, i.e. the Communist Party. I know this sounds extreme, the evil regime, but nonetheless, it was too much for some people and only gave them a reason to discriminate against African Americans even more. The socio-political atmosphere during post-war America fueled the growing racial tensions and anxieties. Seriously, it really did. You have of African Americans moving into white neighborhoods, leaving the South to pick its own cotton. You have the white people freaking out because they don't know how to communicate cross-culturally, so they move to suburbia and leave urban areas to the African Americans. You have the communists trying to convert African Americans to follow their Marxist religion. On top of this, the white people lost their decent jobs to the recently arrived African Americans, which got those decent jobs probably for the first time ever. Oh, and uh, one more thing. The NAACP was also growing in numbers in post-war American society. What does all this add up to? A destabilization of the American way of life and an increased anxiety over racial relations. So, what do the American people need? Well, of course, film noir! What function did film noir fill besides the proverbial emptiness and inherent lack that supposedly everyone experiences? I'll tell you. Film noirs were meant to reflect the urban malaise that had washed over the country in post-war America. Everywhere people turned, the old and familiar structures were crumbling down from women in the workplace to African Americans living in desegregated communities. Oh my! Where did the African American shoe shiner go? 
or what happened to a good old-fashioned housewife? And people were wondering, could things ever be the same again? No. Film noirs reflected the post-war American society's moral ambiguity as seen through the dark scenes and association with blackness. This, of course, did not help African Americans because through association or minimal representation in film noir, the home fatale could take on an extra air of coolness or emphasize criminality depending upon how you would read the particular scenes. Yes, film noirs did wonders to reflect the racial anxieties and stereotypes running rampant in post-war American culture, Blackness became associated with the degraded conditions of the black urban city. Why else would film noirs take place in urban cities? Coincidence? I think not. Let's explore this further. Okay, so I've broken down the representation of African Americans in post-war American film noirs into two categories, non-existent and marginal. In non-existent film noirs, there is a complete absence of any depiction of race other than white, such as in the asphalt jungle and detour. All you see is white people everywhere. This is rather odd since in real life, the urban cities are teeming with African Americans. It makes you wonder how they completely removed even the slightest glimpse of an African American. There definitely was not a shortage of them especially extras in California since, I mean, they just went through the Great Migration. So what happened? What is a plausible reason for this omission? I think it all stems back to the need for stabilization and the vision of a world that is safe to the white viewing audience. Why does it seem so normal not to see any African Americans in these films? More importantly, jazz is typically associated with the African American culture and reflects violence and discordance. Yet, in Detour, as you can see right here, we see a jazz scene where the musicians, waiters, and patrons are all white. What? That's weird! It not only deviates from the standard usage of African Americans in film noirs as fulfilling subservient roles, especially in jazz scenes, but it also manages to further marginalize the plight of African Americans and their fight for equality. Ask yourself, what is a bigger insult to race relations? Non-existent representation or marginal roles? Do you think the non-existent films take a blow at civil and labor rights equality? What social commentary would you offer knowing a little bit about the socio-political climate of the time? The next category of African American representation is marginalization. This means that there is little reference to African Americans in the film, and those minimal depictions usually conform to society's popularly held stereotypes. In The Big Clock, we see one African American in the entire film for about three seconds, seriously. He is at the hotel fulfilling a subservient role. In The Killers, we find one African American at the beginning of the film playing a subservient role as a cook, not a chef, mind you. Also, in Sudden Fear, Myra has a black attendant that takes care of her every wish. So, moving right along. Here's where it gets more interesting. In Double Indemnity, we generally see African Americans in the film when Neff needs an alibi. This reinforces the connection between blackness and criminality. Charlie and the African-American train attendant innocently confirm Neff's non-involvement with killing Mr. Dietrichson for the insurance money. And once again, the African-American is set up to serve as a means to the end for the white agenda. African-American association in film noirs results in blackening of white deviants. Doesn't blackness sound like a really contagious disease? Yuck. I'll take some of the coolness factor, please. In Kiss Me Deadly, Mike Hammer is seen in a segregated African-American jazz club. In this particular scene, the association with blackness serves to increase Mike's coolness factor 
and provides a means for Mike's more emotionally expressive side to reveal itself. You know, this is the only point in the movie where Mike drops his macho persona and gets real with the African Americans of the jazz club. Of course, after the death of his friend Nick. Anyways, this scene is a little tricky because it triggers additional racial anxiety due, the, due to the white person's tendency to suppress their emotions. This means that Mike, relating emotionally with African Americans, not only affords him greater liberty to take on a black persona to do the dirty work that he has to do in the movie, but it also points to something deeper and more ingrained in our society, the stereotype that African Americans are more emotionally expressive than white people. Finally, we see one other reference to an African American when Mike is interrogating Eddie, the boxing manager. So, we go one step up in this movie and the representation of African Americans. However, they are still fulfilling stereotypical roles. And are we ready for the piece de resistance out of the past? It has been referred to as one of the finest examples of film noir in Hollywood history. Wow, this is a pretty big statement to make. While I agree with it because this is one of my favorite film noir movies, let's take a deeper look as to why this statement just makes good sense. Okay, so I've watched this movie more times than I should probably admit, and every time I do, more layers of the movie reveal itself. First of all, Jeff's interactions throughout the whole movie are laid back and nonchalant. This serves as an example for the American white public to resolve mounting racial anxieties over African Americans moving into their area, due to the Great Migration, of course. I coolly ignore you, and you coolly ignore me. It's that simple. This provides a safe means to negotiate cross-cultural communication for people that are new to desegregation. Great. So we have a surface reading of the jazz club scene where African Americans fulfill subservient roles and are around jazz music. The nonchalant interactions point to an ambivalent attitude regarding race depiction, right? Wrong. <laughs> we'll take a look at a clip in a little bit here, and when you watch it, View it from the surface of it being a jazz club with the typical trappings of African-American representation in film noirs, but also watch it from this angle. What if I were to tell you the reason Jeff is at the jazz club is to track down Kathy Moffat for wit? Not a big deal, right? But what if I were to tell you there is a story in a story? Try this. Jeff is filling the meta-story role of slave catcher for Wit, who is the plantation owner and Kathy is the fugitive slave. Eunice is her sister, which explains why she wouldn't give up Kathy's exact location. Tell me what you think and pay close attention to what Eunice says about Kathy in the first part of the clip. Enjoy! Also, if you get a chance, watch Out of the Past in its entirety from the meta story of Kathy being a fugitive slave. Make it your Friday date night. It's fun. Sure, I promise. Okay, this so here we go. Jeff you want to ask Which one of you is Eunice Leonard? Me. May I ask you a few questions? Come on, hot this time. You work for Catherine Moffat? Not anymore. She's gone. She got pushed around. I wouldn't have stayed myself, only she got sick being vaccinated. How come you're asking? I want to find her. You want to find her for that man? No, oh, for myself. Where'd she go? Maybe I oughtn't to tell nothing. Maybe more harm would come to her if you didn't. Is she in harm now? I don't know. She disappeared. Maybe you better say, honey. Well, I can't say much. It wasn't no cold place, though. That girl sure hated snow. Them clothes she took. She was looking for sun. Florida. You sure about that? No, I seem to remember. And I'm sure. No trunk? She only took suitcases. You sure again? I know. I weighed them for on the bathroom scales. How much did they weigh? 131 pounds. Exactly? Exactly. On account of that's what I weigh myself. Thanks. Bring them another round. You don't get vaccinated for Florida. 
The meta story subtly subverts the established system of African American representation instead of supporting it. It tells of our horrifying past with slavery. Do you feel that watching the movie from the meta story of a fugitive slave is over the top based upon the portion of the clip you've seen? I'm going to sum up a few of the key points. So Jim Crow laws were oppressive and led to the Great Migration. Millions of African Americans moved into urban cities across the country. This made some white people feel really uncomfortable, which made them move into the suburbs in all white communities with the help of some real estate agents practicing blockbusting and steering. Then we have the communist influence in civil and labor rights for African Americans, compounded with a lack of strong governmental leadership concerning civil liberties. All of this sets the stage for the socio-political climate of post-war American society and fuels racial tension and anxiety. Then we have film noirs that reflect the urban malaise and destabilization of the nation through the use of darkness, criminality, and blackness to reflect the moral ambiguity and corruption. You add all this up and it results in the racist, yes, racist representation of African Americans in post-war American film noirs. Really, this depiction is just a mirror for the issues facing American society at the time. I mean, take into consideration America just finished a two-front war and was facing the impending Cold War. It's no wonder that the mounting racial tensions posed a threat to the dominant cultural paradigm of white supremacy. In order to effectively deal with the existing and growing racial anxieties, the post-war film noirs essentially decided to whitewash the screen to assert white superiority. The non-existent and marginal subcategories of African American representation in film noirs merely serve as a vehicle to reinforce racial stereotypes, yet at the same time they also shed some light on the plight of the African American race and the obstacles they face in their struggle for freedom from an oppressive regime, the proverbial Jim Crow laws. In conclusion, Kiss Me Deadly, The Killers, Out of the Past, Sudden Fear, The Big Clock, Detour, The Asphalt Jungle, and Double Indemnity reflect the stereotypical socio-political depiction of race in American culture through the racist representation of African Americans in post-war American film noirs. I hope you enjoyed this presentation. I had a great time putting it together. Thank you so much for your participation and have a great summer and rest of your semester. Bye. The end. Thank you.